This lecture will examine the region of South Asia through its environment and physical geography, population and settlement patterns, cultural diversity and cohesion, geopolitical framework, and economic and social development. More specifically, one, explain how the monsoon is generated and describe its importance for South Asia. Two, describe the geological relationship between the Himalayas and other high mountains of northern South Asia and the flat, fertile plains of the Indus and Ganges river valleys. Three, outline the ways in which the patterns of human population growth in South Asia have changed over the past several decades and explain why they vary so strikingly from one part of the region to another. Four, identify the causes of the explosive growth of South Asia's major cities and describe both the benefits and the problems that result from the emergence of such large cities. Five, compare and contrast the ways in which India and Pakistan have dealt with the problems of building national cohesion, considering the fact that both countries contain numerous distinctive language groups. Six, summarize the historical relationship between Hinduism and Islam in South Asia and explain why so much tension exists between the two religious communities today. Seven, explain why South Asia was politically partitioned at the end of the period of British rule and show how the legacies of partition have continued to generate political and economic difficulties in the region. Eight, describe the various challenges that India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka have faced from insurgency movements that seek to carve out new independent states from their territories. Nine, explain why European merchants were so eager to trade in South Asia in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, and describe how their activities influenced the region's later economic development. And finally, ten, describe the ways in which economic and social development varies across the different regions of South Asia and explain why such variability, variability is so pronounced. South Asia is easily defined in terms of physical geography. The bulk of the region forms a subcontinent often called the Indian subcontinent, separated from the rest of Asia by formidable mountain ranges. South Asia is historically united by deep cultural commonalities. Religious ideas associated with Hinduism and Buddhism were once found throughout the region. Islam has also played a major role in this region, containing the second largest Muslim population in the world. Because of the religious diversity, Pakistan and India have experienced many territory disputes, especially in the northern region of Kashmir. In addition, this region is also the second most populous region in the world, with widespread poverty. Along with Sub-Sahara Africa, South Asia is the poorest part of the world. Roughly one-third of India's people subsist on less than one dollar a day. Although South Asia as a whole is one of the poorest regions of the world, parts of India are experiencing rapid economic development based on the high-tech skills of the educated segment of its population. The second most populous region in the world, South Asia, is dominated by India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. The two Himalayan countries of Nepal and Bhutan, along with the island nations of Sri Lanka and the Maldives, round out the region. Many of the seismically active region's landscapes are pro products of the slow northward movement of the Indo-Australian tectonic plate against the Eurasian plate. South Asia has four physical subregions, which are separated from the rest of the Eurasian continent by a series of sweeping mountain ranges, as you can easily detect in the satellite image in the north. The first region is the northern mountains, containing the world's highest mountains, including the Great Himalayan Range with Mount Everest in Nepal at 29,029 feet, the largest mountain peak in the world. Connecting to this range is an equally high Karakoram range to the northwest in Central Asia. These mountains were produced by tectonic activity where numerous earthquakes still occur today which cause extreme damage and loss of human life. The second region is the Indus Ganges Brahmaputra lowlands just south of northern highlands. These lowlands were created by the three major river systems, the Indus, the Ganges, and the Brahma Prutra that built alluvial plains of fertile and easily farmed soils. 
This area is often referred to as the Indus Ganges Plain, sweeping northern India into Bangladesh. In addition, this area is one of the most densely settled areas in the world, containing more than 3,000 people per square mile. The third region is Peninsular India. India. This area jets southward from the Indus Ganges Plains and contains the Deccan Plateau in between the western and eastern Ghats, which are lower uplands on either side of the southern India. Soils are poor or average over much of the Deccan Plateau. And the fourth region is the southern island of Sri Lanka, which sits mainly in the coastal plain and the Maldives, a chain of more than 1,200 flat, low coral atoll islands, and sparsely populated. As might be expected in a highly diverse and densely populated region, South Asia suffers from major environmental problems. These range from salinization of irrigated lands in the dry areas of Pakistan and western India to groundwater pollution from green revolution fertilizers and pesticides. Deforestation and erosion are widespread in upland areas. The link between population pressure and environmental problems is nowhere clearer than in the delta area of the Bangladesh. The search for fertile land has driven people to this hazardous area, placing these people in serious risk of fl from flooding and cyclones. As shown in the top photo left, devastating floods are common in the low-lying delta lands of Bangladesh. Heavy rains come with the southwest monsoon, especially to the Himalayas, and powerful cyclones often develop over the Bay of Bengal. Forest and woodlands once covered most of this region, but due to heavy deforestation, to make room for agriculture has minimized the tree cover in much of the area. A stand of small trees is being logged off in the southern Indian state of Kerala, as shown in the photo on the right. Such forestry practices leave little habitat for wildlife. Wildlife preservation has become an important endeavor in this region, with many species near extinction. Animals such as the Asiatic lion, tigers, and elephants are protected in wildlife reserves. However, population pressures continue to encroach on areas once inhabited by these large animals. As shown in the bottom left photo, tourists photograph a tiger in Ranthambore National Park in the Indian state of Rajasthan. Rajasthanbore is one of the best places in South Asia to see wild tigers. This region experiences seasonal rains and heavy monsoon. It is humid in the north, wet in the south, and dry in the west. The temperatures for most of the region are warm year-round with desert conditions in the west. Except for the extensive Himalayas, South Asia is dominated by tropical and subtropical climates. Many of these climates show a distinct summer rainfall season associated with the southwest monsoon. The climographs for Mumbai and Delhi are excellent illustrations. However, the climographs for locations on the east coast, such as Madra, India, and Colombo, Sri Lanka, show how some locations also receive rain from the northeast monsoon of the winter. This region contains some very distinctive climatic phenomena. The dominant climatic factor for this region is monsoon which is characterized by the seasonal change of wind direction that corresponds to wet and dry periods. Most of the South Asia has three distinct seasons. One is the warm and rainy season of the southwest monsoon from June through October, which is called the summer monsoon as shown in the map. Two, relatively cool and dry season from November to February when the winds are from the northeast called the winter monsoon, again as shown in the map. And third is the hot season from March to early June, during which great heat and humidity build up until the summer monsoon. Another climatic phenomena is the orographic rainfall that occurs over the western Ghats. Orographic rainfall, as depicted in the bottom map, is the rain that is produced from the uplifting and cooling of moist air from the ocean as it heads over mountains. This is why the southwestern tip of India receives huge amounts of rain during the summer monsoon, as it was shown in the climate map. 
Many areas in this region are very vulnerable to the effects of global warming. First, Bangladesh would be extremely vulnerable to any additional rise in sea level. Some small islands have already disappeared and more would follow. Many Himalayan glaciers are rapidly retreating, threatening dry season water supply. Food insecurity would plague Pakistan and northern India during the retreating of glaciers of the Kashmir Mountains. The water from these mountains is used to irrigate agriculture over much of Pakistan's mostly desert country. Most of India's surging electricity demand is met by burning coal and other fossil fuels. Currently India is the sixth largest emitter of carbon dioxide from the burning of coal and has no immediate plans to reduce their emissions. Video question 1. Please pause the video and answer the following. Explain why the monsoon is so critical to life in South Asia. In your own words, using the text as a guide, be thorough and specific with your answer. Except for the desert areas of the west and high mountains of the north, South Asia is a densely populated region. Particularly high densities are found on the fertile plains along the Indus and Ganges rivers and in India's coastal lowlands. In rural areas, the population is typically clustered in villages, often located near water sources such as streams, wells, canals, or small tanks that store water between monsoon rains. It is easy to see the Indus Ganges plains area from the population map. Beginning at the Arabia Sea near Pakistan's coastal city of Karachi, moving northward along the Indus River towards the Kashmir Mountains to a peak and then swinging downward along the Ganges River in the inverted arc in northern India and ending in the country of Bangladesh at the Bay of Bengal. South Asia will soon will surpass East Asia as the world's most populous region. Overall, fertility levels have dropped remarkably in recent years, but population continues to grow rapidly in many areas, particularly in north central India and Pakistan. In addition, this region is still relatively rural, with very low rates of urbanization. Also, most population pyramids look like a true pyramid with high percentages of population under 15. A varied family planning program exists in this region. Sri Lanka has had le relatively low birth rates for decades, as well as relatively high longevity figures, and thus has a well-balanced population pyramid as shown on the left. Pakistan, in contrast, has a much higher birth rate, as well as a lower average lifespan, and thus has a bottom-heavy pyramid, as shown on the right. Although the government acknowledges the birth rate is excessive, the country was slow to develop an effective, coordinated family planning program. Large-scale movements of people occur in all parts of South Asia, as shown in the map. Despite the region's poverty, it, is still attract, it still attracts large numbers of refugees from war and oppression from Afghanistan and Burma, although many people are now returning to Afghanistan from refugee camps in Pakistan. Within the region, most movement directs people away from particularly poor and overcrowded areas to large cities, more prosperous areas, and less densely populated districts. Several areas stand out as zones of intensive out-migration. First, people are moving out of Bangladesh into the predominant rural areas of India. Second, people are moving out of the crowded mountain valleys in Nepal into the lowlands along the Indian border. Both migration patterns have acerbated ethnic and religious tensions in the new areas. And third, people are moving out of Sri Lanka and from Kashmir seeking security away from their battle-scarred homelands. South Asia is one of the least urbanized regions in the world, yet people are beginning to move into cities at a more rapid pace. Therefore, rural to urban migration has been on the rise. The main agricultural output in this region is rice, wheat, and millet. A large amount of irrigation water is needed to grow rice in Sri Lanka, as is apparent from the photo on the bottom. Rice is also a main crop in the lower Ganges Valley and Delta, along the lower Indus River of Pakistan and on India's coastal plains. This region has historically had low agricultural yields for a variety of complex reasons, and therefore food security has been an issue until about the 1970s, when the Green Revolution occurred. The Green Revolution is the name given to agricultural cultivation techniques based on hybrid crop strains and the heavy use of industrial fertilizer and pesticides. 
the Green Revolution did indeed help the food security issues, whereas agricultural production did grow faster than the population. However, this has not come without environmental and social costs. Serious environmental problems result from chemical dependency of the new crop strain. This constant increase in chemicals have therefore contaminated many wells in the areas where these pesticides have been used. In addition, the chemicals are expensive and only the wealthier farmers can afford to buy them, leaving the poorer farmers to borrow money to compete and often are removed from their properties for failure to pay the debt. The photo at the top shows a tomato farm using the Green Revolution techniques. There are several cities in India with over one million residents, even though most of the region is rural. The rapid growth of these cities are causing widespread urban problems such as homelessness, poverty, congestion, water shortages, air pollution, and sewage disposal. Many cities in India include Mumbai, the capital Delhi, and Kolkata. Hundreds of thousands of people in Mumbai, the largest city in India, live in crude hutments with no sanitary facilities built on formerly busy sidewalks. Hutment construction is forbidden in many areas, but wherever it is allowed, sidewalks quickly disappear as shown in the photo. Located in Delhi are the embassies, luxury hotels, government office buildings, and airline offices necessary for a vibrant political capita, capital. Calcutta, on the other hand, is emblematic of the problems faced by rapidly growing cities in developing countries. This city is overpopulated and underserviced. Islamabad, as shown in the photo on the left, now the capital of Pakistan, is a newly planned city referred to as a forward capital, which is a capital deliberately moved to a place near a contested area, namely the Kashmir region, to solidify its presence within that area. This planned city would make a statement through its name about the religious foundation of Pakistan. Islamabad has been the capital of Pakistan since the 1960s, and before then, the capital city was Karachi on the southern coast, far from the center of the country. Dhaka, as shown in the photo on the right, the capital of Bangladesh, has emerged as a vibrant metro metropolis in recent decades. Although its slums are extensive, its central commercial district is relatively orderly and prosperous. Cheap and abundant labor in Dhaka ha has made the city a global center for clothing, shoe, and sports equipment manufacturing. Video question number two. Please pause the video and answer the following. In your own words, how has the Green Revolution helped and hurt this region? In your own words, using the text as a guide, be thorough and specific with your answer. Historically, South Asia forms a well-defined cultural region. A thousand years ago, Virtually the entire area was unified by ideas and social institutions associated with Hinduism. The subsequent arrival of Islam added a new religious dimension without undercutting the region's cultural unity. British imperialism subsequently imposed several cultural features over the entire region. However, Hindu nationalism is on the rise. Hindu nationalists promote the religious values of Hinduism as, a result, as, as the essential fabric of Indian society. This, demantel, this dismantling of the Barbary Mosque in Ayodhya by Hindu nationalists in 1992 caused intense religious conflict in many parts of India. More recently, Hindu-Muslim Brotherhood groups have emerged to try to foster understanding and mutual respect. A rally of one such group is shown in the photo. It is believed that the roots of South Asian culture may extend back 5,000 years to the Indus Valley civilization based on irrigated agriculture and vibrant urban centers. It is unknown how the civilization vanished, but archaeological records indicate that a new civilization emerged later in the Ganges Valley from which social, religious, and intellectual influences spread throughout lowland South Asia. Later the area expanded into the Mauryan Empire which ruled much of the subcontinent in the 3rd century BCE. These early civilizations are shown in the map. One of the first two civilizations sprang Hinduism, a complicated faith that incorporates diverse forms of worship and lacks any standard system of beliefs. All Hindus share a common set of epic stories usually written in the sacred language of Sanskrit. 
the caste system, which is the strict division of social society into different hierarchically ranked hereditary groups of economic, employment, and social positions, also emerged early during this time. The Mauryan Empire was guided by the faith of Buddhism, which was taught by a former elite caste member, Siddhartha Gautama or Buddha. Buddha rejected his life under the caste system and set out on a journey to enlightenment. He preached that the path to nirvana was open to all, regardless of social position. He had many followers, and the spread of Buddhism expanded to the East, Southeast, and Central Asia. However, even though it was popular, Buddhism never replaced Hinduism in South Asia. Islam also challenged Hinduism as well. Introduced into the region later, Turkish-speaking Muslims invaded the north and began to settle permanently. The Mughal Empire, who were also Muslim, dominated much of the northern regions during the 16th and 17th centuries. Islam quickly spread, and eventually Pakistan and Bangladesh became prom predominantly Muslim. Even though the caste system still exists today, it is not as prevalent, especially in urban areas, as it once was in the region. It was also not uniformly distributed across India as well. It has never been significant in India's rural areas, and its role is fading in modern Pakistan and Bangladesh, and marginal in the Buddhist society of Sri Lanka. Nonetheless, caste is the complex social order of the Hindu world, and that the lower one's position is in the hierarchy, the more potentially polluting one body supposedly is. The caste system is broken into five categories. The top three groups constitute the traditional elite, with religious leaders, royalty, military, and high-class merchants. The majority of Indians, India's population fits in the fourth category, which has your more agricultural and craft-based occupations. The fifth caste group actually sits outside of the hierarchy, which are the Dalits or untouchables. Dalits were not allowed to enter enter Hindu temples and had jobs that were considered unclean, like leather workers, disposal of dead animals, scavengers, latrine cleaners, and swine herders. Today in India's challenge changing environment, the caste system has been gradually chipped away to where the caste system is technically illegal. The India government also insists that the significant percentage of university and government jobs be reserved for students from low caste backgrounds. The Dalits have produced several national leaders. The main architect of India's constitution was B. R. Ambedkar, who was also noted as a philosopher, historian, and economist. M. Ambedkar was born to a poor Dalit family and faced significant discrimination as a child and young man. The majority of the population in this region as a whole is predominantly Hinduism. Islam is scattered around in India, but it is the majority religion in Pakistan and Bangladesh. Sikhism, which is a combination of Islam and Hinduism, originated in the late 15th century in the northern Punjab region, Punjab region of India. At the time, Punjab was the site of religious fever, fervor, and the new faith combined elements of both religions and thus appealed to many who felt trapped between their competing claims. Many Orthodox Muslims, however, view Sikhism as a heresy precisely because it incorporated elements of their own religion. Devout Sikh men are highly visible because they do not cut their hair or their beards. Instead, they wear their hair wrapped in a turban and often tie their beards close to their face. Buddhism is, is mainly in Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Bhutan, and Jainism can be found in northwest India. Jainism emerged at, at around the same time as Buddhism as a protest against Orthodox Hinduism. Most notably, this religion takes a non-violent approach to life to its ultimate extreme. They are forbidden to kill any living creature, therefore they wear gauze masks as to not inhale small insects, and they do not engage in agriculture because they believe plowing could kill small creatures. Other religious groups include Christianity and tribal religions, but are very scant in this region. A major linguistic divide separates the Indo-European languages of the North from the Dravidian languages of the South. The Dravidian language family is unique to South Asia. In the Himalayan areas, most languages belong to the Tibetan Burman family. Of the Indo-European languages, Hindi is the most widely spoken with some 480 million speakers, which makes it the second most widely spoken language in the world. Most other language, major languages are closely associated with states in India. 
Within these broad divisions are many different languages, each associated with a distinct culture, therefore multilinguism, multilingualism is very common in this region. Now, Indian nationalists would prefer to see one language named Hindi to unify the country, but provincial loyalty prevents that from happening. English was introduced during European colonization and had become the de facto language of the country's businessmen and elite. Thusly, English is the main integrating language and is widely used in the region. The widespread use of English in South Asia has not only facilitated the spread of global culture into the region, but also helped South Asian culture production reach a global audience, in addition to having economic benefits. It is a two-way flow from South Asia to the rest of the world. The spread of South Asian culture abroad is in part from the migration flows of its people. As shown in the map, large numbers of South Asian workers settled in other colonies during the British Imperial period. Today, roughly 50% of the population of such places as Fiji and Mar Mauritius are of South Asian descent. More recently, large numbers have settled and are still settling in Europe and North America. Large number of temporary workers, both laborers and professionals, are employed in the wealthy oil-producing countries of the Persian Gulf. Many contemporary migrants to the U.S. are doctors, software engineers, and other professionals, making Indian Americans one of the country's wealthiest ethnic groups. Video question 3. Please pause the video and answer the following. How is the caste system discriminatory? Also, compare and contrast caste with apartheid in South Africa. You may need to revisit page 264 in your text to help you. In your own words, using the text as a guide, be thorough and specific with your answer. Given the cultural mosaic of South Asia, it is not surprising that ethnic tensions have created numerous geopolitical problems in the region, including separatist movements and boundary disputes. Particularly vexing are ethnic tensions in Sri Lanka and Kashmir. China and India have also had boundary disputes in which small portions are claimed by one and controlled by the other. At the onset of European colonialism before 1700, much of South Asia was dominated by the powerful Mughal Empire as shown in the upper left map. It was only cities on the coast that Europeans claimed as trading posts which set up the British East India Company, a private firm that acted as an arm of the British government. This company oversaw trading in the area and began to ta stake out South Asian empire of its own. Under Britain, the wealthiest parts of the region were ruled directly, but other lands remained under the partial authority of indigenous rules, as shown in the upper right map. Independence for the region came after 1947 when the British abandoned their extensive colonial territory and India organized itself as a federal state with 29 states, very much like that of the United States, where significant power is given to its individual states. Bangladesh, formerly East Pakistan, gained its independence at the end of 1971 after a short struggle against centralized Pakistani rule from the West. Since 1972, the boundaries are as noted in the bottom map. Violent ethnic conflicts persist in many parts of South Asia and specifically in Kashmir and Sri Lanka. Unrest in Kashmir inflames the continually hostile relationships between two nuclear powers of India and Pakistan. These two countries have been at odds with each other from the very beginning, mainly due to religious differences in the area. Kashmir is predominantly Muslim which Jammu to the south is predominantly Hindu. Today, many Kashmiris wish to join Pakistan, while many others argue for an independent state. This conflicted area is shown in the map on the left. The majority of Sri Lankans are Sinhalese Buddhists, many of whom maintain that their country should be a Buddhist state. A Tamil-speaking Hindu minority in the northeast strenuously resists this idea. Tamil militants who waged war against the Sri Lankan government for several decades until defeated in 2009, hoped to create Christian and Muslim country in their northern homeland. Separate Christian and Muslim populations make for a complex social environment in Sri Lanka. The map on the right shows the areas occupied primarily by either side. As noted, there are pockets of Christians and Muslims throughout mo the mostly, but mostly along the coastlines. India, a 
accuses Bangladesh of allowing separatist sanctuary on its side of the border and objects as well to continuing Bangladeshi immigration. As a result, India began building a fence between its territory and that of Bangladesh in 2003 in order to reduce illegal immigration and stop the influx of militants. The photo on the left shows members of the Indian Border Security Force who are patrolling a segment of the border barrier. In the photo on the right, an Indian officer looks through binoculars in war-torn Kashmir. Relationships between India and Pakistan have remained extremely t tense since independence in 1947. Moreover, the, with both countries now un nuclear powers, the fear that border hostilities will escalate into wider warfare has become a nightmarish possibility. Video question number four. Please pause the video and answer the following. In your own words, explain why India is more concerned about its border with Bangladesh than it is about its border with Nepal, Bhutan, and Burma. Using your text as a guide, be thorough and specific in your answer. There is a profound dichotomy in South Asia as it relates to economic development. It is one of the poorest regions, yet it has some of the most immense fortunes. The region has achieved many world-class scientific and technological accomplishments, but also has some of the world's highest illiteracy rates. Poverty in India is rampant, which results in a significant amount of child labor. The photo on the left, this 10-year-old boy, is moving a large burden of plastic waste by bicycle. In the map on the right, India shows marked differences in regional levels of economic development. Its more prosperous areas are generally located in the west and south, while the north and east lag behind. As noted in the table, core areas of development have emerged, surrounded by peripheral areas that have lagged behind, creating landscapes of striking economic disparity. Looking at percent population living below $2 per day, Bangladesh, at 76.5%, is one of the highest in the world, while only 12.2% in the island countries, country of Maldives. These two are very strikingly different. Another striking difference is for the adult literacy in the countries of Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Bangladesh is on the low end of the spectrum, while Sri Lanka is on the high end. Another striking disparity is for the under age 5 mortality rate. Can you spot the countries on either end of the spectrum? Even though Nepal is an isolated and remote location due, its, due to its rugged terrain, it has long been one of the world's main destinations for adventure tourism, although businesses have suffered in recent years due to the country's political instability. Many tourists in Nepal stay in rustic lodges, several of which have posted advertisements visible in the photo on the left. Not all the economic news coming from Bangladesh is negative. The internationally famous Grameen Bank supplies low-interest microloans to the women of Bangladesh. The photo on the right shows funds being dispersed at a Grameen branch meeting. Such microcredit operations were pioneered in Bangladesh and have been more recently spread across many of the underdeveloped parts of the world. These loans are given to women who typically lack the credit and resources to obtain capital for entrepreneurial endeavors to alleviate poverty within their families. India's west central states of Gugatra and Maharashtra are noted for their industrial and financial clout as well as for their agricultural productivity. Gurat Gurat Gugurat, I'm sorry, Gugurat was one of the first parts of South Asia to experience substantial industrialization and its textile mills are still among the most productive in the region. The photo shows a modern, a modern cotton mill in the city of Ahmedabad in Gugurat. In addition, the large state of Maharashtra is usually viewed as India's economic pay setter. The huge city of Mumbai has long been the financial center, media capital, and manufacturing powerhouse of India. The center of India's fastest growing high technology sector lies farther to the south, especially in the city of Bangalore, or more recently changed to Bengaluru. Many computer software companies emerged in this area in the 1980s and 90s, and then became known as Silicon Plateau. 
Furthermore, many other rival cities have recently emerged as high-tech centers such as Hyderabad, which is often called Cyberbad. Despite South Asia's rapidly growing global connections, the region as a whole is still relatively self-contained and not the world's most globalized region, especially in regard to finance. Internet use remains low, especially in Bangladesh and Nepal. The two maps show exports, direct foreign investment, internet uses, and tourism as their global linkages. However, outsourcing has become a big advantage to many firms and are on the rise. South Asia's social indices show relatively low levels of health and education, which is hardly surprising considering the region's poverty. However, education in Kerala has been a huge success. India's southwestern state of Kerala, which has virtually eliminated illiteracy, is South Asia's most, most highly educated region. It also has the lowest fertility rate in South Asia. Because of this, many argue that women's education and empowerment are the best and most enduring form of contraception. The photo shows students in Kerala's education system. Asian women, South Asian women are accorded a very low social position in both Hindu and Muslim traditions and their social relations with men outside the family were severely restricted. For example, women are forbidden to engage in certain economic activities. They are excluded from inheriting land. Women after puberty leave their family and live with the family of their husband and older women are not supposed to remarry after a spouse's death. And a disturbing statistic is that of gender ratios. Men are favored because they usually stay with their families and work, therefore causing many gender-selected abortions. Video question number five. Please pause the video and answer the following. List and discuss in detail three economic successes in the region. In your own words, using the text as a guide, be thorough and specific in your answer.